The Fujicast is an independent loading zone production. Well, you're looking very good for your age, Kev. 200. 200. Woo! Have we both aged? 200. Happy birthday to us. Happy birthday to to us. us. Raise a glass in the air. And I can't think of a line after that. There we go. It's a bit early for that, isn't it? Oh, it's never too early, is it? Never. We're on airport time. We'll have another one. We're never going to get through this. We'll be absolute. Oh, remember, I can't. I, well, I can't swear, but you can now. Oh. <laughs> but don't do, don't do it. <laughs> Just if it occasionally pops out, if you pardon the phrase, then uh, then fine. But 200, Kev. I know, hey, incredible, isn't it? We, we, um, when we started, I know we've told this story before, but when we started, I remember you saying to me, well, how long should we make it? And, uh, I don't know, we, we said some arbitrary figure, and you said, well, no one's going to want to listen to more than 10 minutes or 15 minutes of us. And that was the original plan, wasn't it? <laughs> Just yeah. yeah. <laughs> 5, 10, 15, <laughs> I, I 20 reckon, minutes. Uh, I reckon people only do listen for about 10 minutes, though. Don't do you? Know? Yeah, then they after that, they don't Spotify listen. Or something, don't they? They're going to listen to Joe Rogan after that. Yeah. Something has happened as the... We almost didn't have a 200th show for the reason this brought... Well, we'd have done it another way, but this broadcast desk that's seen us through thick and thin, Kev, and also uh, three months of every dayin' um, for, for, the, uh, for the one during the lockdown, gradually, uh, on the left-hand side, you know I have my faders for the microphones, one, two, three, OK? Uh, engine one's now gone. Engine oh. two went last week, and yeah. we're now on engine three. You didn't you spend a small fortune on all that stuff? I did, yeah. Well, it only lasted a few years. Send it back. <laughs> get the man out. Get the man. Ring the radio well, fusion. I, blues. I did try it. to get a man out, but he was in Devon on holiday, so I said, "Oh, I can't do anything till um, a year, a year Tuesday." The Fuji cast. And that was about the and best he could. He's got to get a lorry first, I expect. Yeah, oh, that's true. Yeah. Um, well, after he's paid the heating bill, look at that, Kev. Ours has gone up forty percent in one week. <laughs> don't I'm not even. I don't. This world is falling the, apart. The, the, the cheapest deal. We well, and it's not just the UK. We can't even bra- blame this one on Brexit. One thing's for sure: rich people will get richer, poor people will get poorer, <laughs> and then the world will keep spinning. Just. I like think it. we need to go and get some tight green light, Kev, and become the Robin Hoods of tomorrow. Ah, <laughs> oh, dear. Does Malmesbury have a forest? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Uh, I'm just, I just—I was desperately trying to think of the Robin Hood theme, and I couldn't. Riding through Robin Hood, Robin oh, Hood, yeah. riding Robin through Hood, the Robin whatever. Hood. Yeah. Anyway, well, 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 riding through the glen. <laughs> well, Kev, Kev, riding well, welcome, the glen. welcome to the two hundredth episode. Here we are. We made it. We should have been having this episode at the House of Photography. Well, had Andreas agreed to it, but I'm sure he would have done. But we should have been having this at the House of Photography, or we should have been doing this in Japan, or we should have been doing this in France, if they'd have us. Uh, or, or, you know, not really you from Bunker Malmesbury and, and me from Bunker Newbury. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, well, it wouldn't have been at uh, the House of Photography, would it? Because TPS is still on, so they're all there uh, at the minute. Yeah. No, they'd have moved TPS for us. Oh no, we we no, we discussed doing it at TPS. Yeah. Oh, they, they would have charged a fortune for us to do something official. Do you think so? Yeah. It cost a million pound just to just to like have a coffee stand there. <laughs> That's um, it. But yeah. No, you're right. We we should have done. We will do it though. We will do something um, semi-official for our uh, what, what might well, be we've, like. We've, we kind of, well, we kind of we we've un- unofficially now said that it's going to be tw- 2022, isn't it? Right at the start, probably. Yes, something like that. So yeah, yes. they'll, they'll... Right, right in the middle of flu season. Yeah, <laughs> the next <laughs> pandemic. But it's okay, Kev, because you know I got trained up to do in- injections. So I'll just well, bring all the kit along, and we'll do a we'll do a max vax. <laughs> well, TPS was the first place that I had to ever had to do a proof of vaccination to get in. Oh, was it? Yeah, I didn't know I had to do that when I got there. They said, "Have you got your, Have you got your proof?" So I showed them my name badge. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not he, proof of that. He was with his blue gloves and his, uh, you know, and his, his hazmat mask on and everything. Right. And he was like, what are, you, what are you showing me that for? I was like, because I want to get in. He went, no, proof proof of uh, vaccination. Right. I was like, oh, right. Okay, fine. And then so I found my little dog-eared piece of card in my my wallet. Do you not have it on? Thing. You should have it on an app, Kev. I did, yeah, app. but it's much quicker. It's funny and about looking for apps, and then you've got to log into the NHS and all that stuff. And I just keep my little piece of card in my pocket. Well, the last time a man with blue rubber gloves was asking you questions was that at that airport we went to, and I've never been so embarrassed in all my life. I had to leave you there. 
<laughs> I'm, he's, I'm not with him. Yeah. Ah, so anyway, um, 200 uh, today, 200 episodes. But um, it rolls on, doesn't it? Despite us saying if you didn't get your questions in, that was it. We're we not- always knew we'd be back. A few have trickled in. So, so where do we start? Do you want to start? Well, we didn't really say what's going on on the show, but you know the score by now. Questions, questions. You're talking to Sandra Adorno, aren't you, about those amazing pictures on the Brazilian beaches? Yes. Um, and the fact that she came to photography very late in life. Yeah, which I think I think I think that's a lovely story. I like hearing. So the, Actually, those not of, late. Not late in life. That seems an awful thing to say. Well, it wasn't very late in life at all. It was just perhaps a little bit later than some other people. That's her complaining. <laughs> and and uh, also, book of the week this week is... Uh, book of the week this week is a really beautiful book uh, archived by Bertine van Manen. Um, so that that's the come and your questions. And, and Kev... Um, has been working at some you've been working at some big weddings of late you were at one the other day with 120 the week before that was 250 the week before that was 1500 or something how's the masking rules going on with the weddings you're going to yeah nobody's wearing masks uh the suppliers the venue managers are um i got told off going in the kitchen the other day at a venue <laughs> can i have uh, some food i asked <laughs> i asked the uh the head hod show i said can yeah. i come and take some pictures of the chefs yeah. doing chefy things yeah he went, uh, yeah, have you got a mask? I went, yeah, of course, so I'll put it on. And he, I, I said, get, go and ask the chef first. Don't, you know, I don't want to just pitch up and start taking pictures yeah, of him. Yeah, yeah. So he did, and uh, and I, I did. He was fine. I was taking pictures of him and everything. And then the, the deputy head honcho came in and said, what are you doing? Hmm. Nobody wants to see pictures of sausages and things like that. I said, oh, they do. Yeah, it's all part of the story. Said, no, they don't. Get out. <laughs> oh, really? He didn't understand that? <laughs> what a miserable old sausage, quite literally. Yeah. Uh, so you did. Yeah. Did you leave with your, your tail between your legs? Well, I took a couple of pictures on the way out, but yeah, yeah. in the end, it did. Yeah, that, that cheeky kind of got you, got you. Uh, <laughs> One more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the masks are. Wrong. Are you wearing? Now, when are you wearing your mask? Uh, when I'm around Gemma and the kids. <laughs> yeah, at weddings, Kev. When do you wear? Uh, I typically wear. I t- I take it off eventually. I mean, I, yeah. I typically wear it when I go into the venue because you just don't know what the, what the rules and regs are. Um. And that's it now, really. I mean, I must admit, I, because I can't, I hate wearing masks. When, yeah, I, yeah. when I'm shooting with a mask, I always lower it down below my nose because otherwise the, well, the viewfinder steams up. Yeah, it's pointless. And, and I just realised it's pointless. So, yeah, I take it off. Um, I am still a little bit, uh, actually, no, I'm not. I just get on with, I just. I'm what, just what about the dancing? Yeah, I'm just in there now. Are you? Yesterday I was in the middle. Yeah, no mask. Well, and, and the thing is, you know what I've what I've come to to kind of think is that well, one of two things. I think uh, possibly people won't want to hear this, but I do think that eventually, you know, it's, everybody's going to get it, and you know, people will have it very mildly. Hopefully, I think it's out there, and you know, and the other thing I was thinking is perhaps maybe I even had it, you know, during lockdown one. Yeah. I did feel a bit poorly at one point, and with the uh, with a double jab and everything, because I'm still doing PCR test every day. Uh, no, not yeah. PCR. I can't be doing PCR every day. Or oh, lateral flow test yeah, every yeah, day. Yeah. You know, the thing where you've got to do that horrible stuff. Mm. I just do that every day. It's always negative. You know, stopped, they, they, touch wood and all that stuff. Yeah, the lateral flow, by the way, I, I, I assume you're doing it the same way. Uh, people have stopped shoving it down their throat now. It's just straight up the nostril, bang, into the brain. Oh, really? I've been yeah. sticking it in my ear. <laughs> Well, there's, put it. <laughs> there's your problem. That's the, yeah. Call them out with the blue gloves. <laughs> it's, perp- it's perfect for the odd itch. <laughs> it's clearing my ears out perfectly. Wonderful. Great stuff. Oh, <laughs> it's horrible. Right. I tell you what, they're on that point, they're talking yeah. about uh, ears and things yeah. like that, and the fact that they don't make earbuds out of plastic anymore. They no, shouldn't. they don't. They, they no, shouldn't no, buy them. No. There's a terrible waste going on with those... Um, lateral flow test well yeah we, we've been saying this La- i mean the oh, lateral Lord. flow wastage it must be there must be a mountain of it there really uh, must um, and the environmental impact i mean yeah. it's all plastic and yes you it know, is yeah 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 awful yeah yeah it must be a better way anyway i'm sure people with bigger foreheads than us are thinking about that <laughs> maybe right should we go for questions do you want to start on me uh i'll start okay facebook group um first one as i always do is the uh latest one to the thread and it's from keith martin uh 44 minutes ago uh, actually there's another one just just come in just as we speak anyway i'll go with keith you're sounding like a pilot now Kev. you're doing the just come in 40 minutes ago flying across bear biscay 
You've, tu- you've turned into Captain Mullins. Uh, I've got to, I, <laughs> God help us. Seems on, bad, on. doesn't it? But I have got a sore throat. Have you? <laughs> yeah. That's one. Yeah. Of, that's one of the signs, Kev. That's one of the top. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, all right, these... I got what, something in my ear. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> it's bulletproof. That's that's in the top five of the symptoms. Is it? Never mind no. the uh, all these people spending money on. Uh, I heard this the other day on the Zoe report. All those those people spending money on the fancy stuff to register your temperature. Um, it, 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 that's number seven in the list now, possibly now eighth, I think. Did you say on the Zoe Ball show? No, the, Z- the Zoe report. Oh. Nothing to do with Zoe Ball. Oh. Anyway, uh, go on. I love Zoe Ball. Um, <laughs> uh, Keith Martin says, says has, uh, has anyone ever sent your wives a complaint? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Yes, yes. Uh, for yeah. those that don't listen to the end of the show, yeah. <laughs> uh, there is a there is a teaser at the end that says uh, something along the lines of, for any complaints, please send them to her. I don't think I've got it as a jingle. Uh, I can't play it. But yeah, it says, yeah, for any complaints, then send, yeah. Does, has uh, Gemma ever received one? Probably. Gemma, yeah. But they don't. <laughs> probably they, gets them regularly. They just don't tell us. No, exactly. No. I don't think, no, I don't think. We've received complaints. Yeah, loads. Yeah. <laughs> It's usually about sound effects. There was an email that came in a couple of weeks ago. You didn't read it out, so I don't know whether you were trying to protect me or not, but it was something to do with the the, box, uh, the cameras in my bag, and, and the man was like, it's just rude that he doesn't have dividers. I oh, I did. <laughs> no, I didn't read that out. I didn't want to insult you, Kev. Didn't want you to well, you must me. remember that I, I'm in charge of the email, so I see all the emails. <laughs> oh, you do, don't you? Oh, <laughs> I put that one to one side. I, I, or maybe I was saving it for a moment where I thought, oh, I've got this one as a, as a special uh, weapon. I, I'm prepared know. for that one. I've got, I've got my answer all teed up. Have yeah. you? Uh, maybe yeah. I should find it. Dig it out. Go yeah. on, dig it out. First of all, Mark Dell has sent one in. Hi, gents. Long time, no email. Happy 200th. I was listening to last week's show, and the question asked about style was very interesting. I've attached an image of my beautiful granddaughter, Phoebe. The V I shoot with helps me create a look and style, this is talking about the X100V, of course, that fits my, my family documentary shots. I seem to embrace shadows and enjoy this look. As you said, style evolves, and I think we're spoiled today with the equipment we have available, cameras and processing-wise. On a side note, we're clearing out our house to move, and I came upon my primary school reports. The headmaster wrote in 1972, Mark has a keen eye and a real passion, it seems, for photography. Regards to you both from Mark. What a find, eh? Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I think people do have the... So we were talking about what style is, and, and we kind of identified style as various things. One thing it could be is post-processing, because that definitely plays into style. And you were talking about um, your uh, your um, warmer tones, black and whites, weren't you? Mm-hmm. So that that's, that's a style. Um mm-hmm. Other styles could be physical presence or proximity. Maybe you're somebody who likes shooting with, um, I don't know, a 23 millimeter and getting in really, really close. That could be a style. Mm -hmm. So that, but I think style evolves, though, is what we also discovered wasn't it yeah we don't need to, to kind of rehash it again but yes style evolves and and you, you you know mark's right that actually having a particular camera can influence the style mm. uh, certainly if it's a fixed length focal length camera like the x100v um yeah so uh, i think it's i reckon i'm reasonably good at spotting pictures that are taken on an x100v now yeah or an x100 i should say by proximity or um, yeah that and also the rendering of the images the you know the look and feel of them but of course it was a different sensor really with the well only really with the original x100 so yeah yeah they all had different sensors but yes the original x100 was uh was was like the original and different very different um yeah but yeah i think like the pro yeah x pro one yeah same sensor so it's yeah you can i think i can t- I, i'm reasonably good at telling pictures mm. now that, that are shot on that sense do you think your style has changed th- through using different obviously it changed from using canon to Fujifilm but as you've gone through the different bodies do you do you feel that you work in a different way when you're working with a, a pro body as opposed to a T body e- yes to a certain extent I think with the X pro range I'm less likely now on the X pro 3 I, I very rarely use the flip screen hmm. um, but on my when I use my XT cameras I'm I'm more quite often especially during the the kind of drink reception and stuff using the using the flip screen yeah um and I've got I obviously got the XT4 now which uh 
you know love it or hate it the flip screen on that is is different um and i'm actually i i actually really like that flip screen on the xt4 well, you'll, the, get, you'll get david murray all heated if you're talking it, about it, flip screens in the dancing <laughs> element I, had, I i i i totally understand where david's coming from i have to say because lots of other people have the same opinion in that you know it, it, it is quite annoying that it doesn't just flip down horizontally and you can use it just like all the old flip screens like i do understand that but i do also think that um it has benefits that the others don't you know especially that kind of holding it above your head and tilting it very angle yeah. screen and everything um but uh yeah so yeah definitely definitely kind of feel like i shoot slightly different with the x pro and the xt range i completely forgot that the x 100v had a tilting screen at all mm. <laughs> i'd been using it months and then I thought, oh, this screen tilts. So some of the arguments about tilty screens sort of sticking out and all the rest of it just don't really wash with me. But I don't think that was David's point, to be fair to him. No, David's definitely, is his is about not having it just kind of come down so you can do waist level kind of yeah. looking down, yeah, yeah. Um, which is uh, it is annoying. And, and I, I, you know, I, I find myself with the X-T4 thinking, oh, I wish it would do that. But then you know it's it's horses for courses isn't it i'm sure they'll they'll think about it and yeah. apparently there is one camera that can do all this very angle stuff and do that as well so it must mm. must physically be possible mm. okay um yours from from the facebook group jeremy henderson um he says uh do you, i'm gonna ad lib this a little bit he says do you agree with a well-known youtuber and i'm gonna insert into there sean tucker that Fuji RAW files have a baked-in muddy quality. Mm. My answer is no. A muddy quality? Yeah, so Sean did a, Did you not see it? Sean did a YouTube video. I think he's moved to another camera. I mean, he used to use Fujifilm. He he did a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a Sony shooter now, isn't he? Yeah, I didn't watch the video, I have to say. No. Um, but I saw the post on the Facebook group. Yeah. And I think he's got something else now. Maybe it's a new Sony or might be one of the new Ricoh. The, the oh, Ricoh. no, it's the Ricoh. Because he yeah, yeah he, he did the film about when... Uh, uh, what, what I can't remember the actual title, but it, it was something along the lines of when camera manufacturers listen to those that use the cameras. Paraf that was it. paraphrasing. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. And somewhere in there was, uh, you know, that all Fujifilm pictures are, are muddy. I think muddy as a universal feeling for Fujifilm is is not the way I've experienced it. I mean, all my all my favourite landscape and street pictures. Not not that I've made lots of street, but that that I have have, have been without doubt made on a Fujifilm camera of um, of uh, T or Pro or X100 flavours. But um, I, I have had, as you know, some problems with skin tones as a wedding photographer. And if, that, if that's what he means by muddy, I, I'll admit to having had my own conversations with Lightroom at times. But, but that's more down to me than the, the camera, if, if that's what he means by muddy, Kev. I don't see it. I don't see the muddy stuff. Just um, in skin tones. Just in skin tones. It's, it's, it's always it's going to be coming. It has to come down to processing. You know the processing of the images. Yes, some people process images that to, with a certain look. Yeah, uh, you know, and there's that that fashion. Well, a certain you know style, if you like, not necessarily fashion, where people did that kind of muddy grey, um, mm. muted black oh, and white. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, some people like it, some people don't. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I don't see it at all. And and I, and I have to say that we had this kind of conversation about Tony Northrop, didn't we? Everybody's entitled to their own opinions. Yeah. Everybody's entitled to yeah. To, to make as many clicks as possible on the YouTube videos because that's their business and that's and by, by business I mean business as in their their right but also their business as in their income so so that is absolutely fine but I have to say that you know I'm I'm not necessarily saying for Sean or even for um, Tony but you know there is a you see it a lot you see a lot of people who bite the hands that used to feed them yeah and uh, and those hands you know won't feed you again. So, you know, you, you just got to, I, I think you have to be a little bit conscious of the, the clickbait stuff. And absolutely, I'm not talking about Sean here, but, no. you know, other people are. And, well, no, Sean's uh, never been Fuji. never been sponsored by Fuji, or I don't think any of the companies, uh, photography companies that he's worked with, to be fair, has always been able to have quite a, you know, a, a, a clear view on stuff because of that fact. I think he makes it very clear in the film as well, I'm going with memory, but uh, Rico did not uh, pay him to, to make that film or have those views no i do think he i think he did one of the x100 promo videos for future film but i might, might be wrong but I, yeah. I think he did at some point well, well he certainly made a few films about and, and using the x100 i know because i've watched them kev but in, in terms of the muddiness sean, sean is not the first or last to have used that word and it all comes down to 
Well, it's subjectivity processing. You're right there, Kevin. On that note, Patrick LaRock. Now, I've spoken to Patrick about how he processes his work because he makes everything in colour look delicious. He's he's a man who has his own chemistry. He's, his colour work is he, absolutely... You mean, be- you, mean, you mean God? You're not a big God. <laughs> with, a small, God. With, with a small G, otherwise you're going to be struck down there, Mullins. <laughs> you, you, don't, don't forget your boss on a Sunday. He won't like that, but he might. Well, I don't know. Maybe he's an admirer of Patrick's as well. But, uh, he'll chuckle. He'll love he Yeah, he's, I, I would imagine the real God's got yeah. a picture of Patrick the Rock on his. <laughs> it's, probably got an ori- <laughs> it's probably got an original. Um, so, yeah, I, I've spoken to Pat on a few occasions because I, I did struggle with the waxy skin tones a little bit where, when, I, when I was starting with Fujifilm. I, and we, you and, need and, a bit of clearer before you go to a wedding that's it but uh yeah but patrick i mean what he does i mean the processing he's he's a bit like i'm sure he's like colonel who's the kfc guy colonel sanders you know he's got the special secret um recipe there's something that pat has that his pictures um go talking of colonel sanders i saw him at tps paul he's He's doing very well yeah oh no paul sanders no he's not Hmm. dead colonel sanders Oh, good Lord, no. No, Paul Sanders very much with us. But yeah, I, honestly, I think it's down to processing um, and uh, muddy. I don't know. Maybe people look at my pictures and think, yeah, really muddy, but I can't see it. And so maybe it's a case of what do you think is muddy and what's not. Yeah. It's all Whatever. Sub- you know, so, so there you go. Yeah. Right. And, and what- I, I never had any issues like color processing or anything with my Canon files. It was just yeah. purely down to size and, and being able to see. See exposures in the viewfinders. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and and Anna, who shot all of our stuff, our thing. She yeah. shot most of it on a Nikon files and uh, Nikon cameras, and, and they were wonderful. Yeah, seven fifty, yeah. I think, wasn't it? I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, whatever. Uh, right. You really have to get your head around this one, Kev. Stand by, Jeremy Baker. Morning or evening? Um, I may have mentioned this before, but um, here we go. Feel free to park it, bin it, edit, or summarize as you see fit. Well, I'll do my best. It relates to the uh, an analogy by Finnish American painter Arno Minikin. M- M- I knew I'd get this wrong. Mikinen, not not Peter, no Minkinen, about originality and creativity. There was a there was a something about there was a short excerpt that he sent me. But look, he had a question: Has your creative? It was all about. It's called the Helsinki bus station. Yeah, we've talked about that before. Did we? Yes, we we've definitely we... talked about the Helsinki bus station thing before. We've never had that as a question from Jeremy. What? What? Did... Perhaps not, but it's come up before. What did yeah. we say? What did we say about it? The Helsinki it's bus a, station. It's like a journey, isn't it? You know, stay, staying on the bus at the end yeah. or something. Oh, yeah. we well, maybe we have dealt with this. Yeah. Well, he did have a question. I'm sure it wasn't from Jeremy. Maybe it was a long time ago then. Uh, my question is: How has your creative originality bus journey been? Which buses have you taken? as a result of whose inspiration? Uh, which stops have you jumped off at or thought about jumping off? A very good question. Mm. Stay on the bus, was Arno's advice. Yeah, stay on the bus. Yeah. Um, well, I, I usually just get on the mega bus because it's a quid. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it is a really interesting question. And actually, if you if you do research that um, Helsinki bus station stuff, it's quite an interesting um, like rabbit hole to go down. Yeah. Um, Which buses have you taken then, Kev, apart from the mega bus? I've taken um, mostly black and white buses, mostly emotional buses, yeah. uh, mostly pictures with muddy skin tone buses. <laughs> <laughs> what was the uh, most inspirational bus journey you took? Uh, uh, do you know what? I think prob- possibly the most inspirational bus journey was a very long bus journey. It took me all the way to... Cordoba in Argentina oh, and, yes. uh, and then to the wonderful work of uh, Louis Gavin. Yeah. Was that and, the first time you met Louis? Yeah. Yeah. Is that really yeah, yeah. that? I mean, that bus journey definitely changed you, didn't it? Yeah, I think so. Y- y- yes. Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I love his stuff. Got printed with his of our bed. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful person as well as a wonderful photographer but did, did, it, did it stylistically change you i think it did yeah I, I actually think it did i think what it taught me was that things don't have to be perfect not that my stuff's ever been perfect but you know i, I it, it kind of taught me to not even think about looking for mm. uh you know crisp images sharp images it, it, you know it, it, i just it was really at that point where i started thinking about this idea of uh, of not being a photographer in terms of you know for me and I was talking about this at TPS 
photography is a technique you know it's 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 the the action of pressing the button on the camera and anybody could do that yeah it's really what you see in the viewfinder is you know we're an observers we're observers before photographers yeah. uh, and i think that's where that seed was set there and uh you know watching him work and watching his images and then just speaking to him um you know we became friends and stuff and and i think that when you talk about journeys and inspiration and styles and buses and all that kind of stuff i think possibly that was the yeah the the key bus journey for me did, did uh, you did I mean, you said you watched louis garvin work um mm-hmm. i mean that's very lucky but what were you in his studio or did you spend uh, oh no 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 it was just like uh demonstration stuff you know oh, so okay. um but yeah i mean his He's got a lovely, beautiful studio in uh, Mexico City, I yeah. think, or just outside, actually. Um, yeah. One day I'm going to get out there and, and see him. There's a real piece to his work, isn't there? Yeah, he's just a wonderful person. You know, if, if, if I ever go to dinner with him and um, Patrick LaRock, then, I, well, I'm just not going to go. <laughs> I'm going to sit outside and look through the window. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can serve them. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, I'll just serve them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, oh, yeah. I don't know. Okay. just throwing my head down. They might feel the same way about you. Yeah. So. Well, actually, it's a, quite a um, a good connection, really, because we're on the right side of the world to talk about your um, uh, your interview with our special guest this week, Sandra. Now, I, I know I know you said that um, it's a bit rude to say that she came to it later on in life. But I do like those stories of people that find their, their creative wings in more mature years. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, incredible photographer and an incredible story, really. So here's Sandra Catani Ordono sharing with Kev a little of the journey, a, a truly international one before coming to photography. Yes, I was uh, born in Brazil. I stayed there until I was 13 and then at the end of 12 years old. And uh, then I came to Surrey. I, ha- I went to a boarding school in Surrey. And uh, then I went to another boarding school in Switzerland. And then uh, I went back briefly to Brazil for two years for university, the two first years. And then I went to the States. I graduated twice in California. And then I went to Argentina. Then I went to Paraguay. And then I went to... <laughs> And then I met my husband in Brazil, and then we went to live in Monte Carlo, and then we went to live in London for 20 years, nearly, or 15 years in London, and uh, then in Switzerland, and then now we are between Switzerland and California. It may have been easier for me to ask where you hadn't lived rather than where you had lived. (laughs) Yeah, I just, I moved around, but I was... My parents wanted us to move, all of us, you know. They just wanted us to move, uh, you know, since we were small. So we, I'm, I'm used to being alone for, for, for a long time. Sure. And I'm okay with it. I'm, I'm happy. It, it wasn't so good for my kids. Uh, for, my kids didn't like the moving, but uh, I enjoyed it very much. For me, it was very nice. Well, and also it's good that we can travel again right now um, after yeah. the last couple of oh, years. That's nice. Thank God, yes. <laughs> so you mentioned that you, uh, you know, you had your uh, graduations and things like that. But but if I if if I'm right, I think you you came to photography uh, later on in your life. Is that is that I'm what happened? I'm 68, and it was uh, at 60, so it was eight years ago, and I had no idea how to photograph. I had one of those small Instamat, a Sony, it was snowed me, Sony Snap or something like that. Small little thing like this. And, and they were, that's how, I never paid attention to photography, never, ever. And uh, it was my daughter who she, um, her minor in university was photography and she was very enthusiastic about photography and she invited me as a birthday, 60th birthday present, to go to this um, Alex and Rebecca Webb's workshop in Barcelona. So it was a five-day workshop. So I paid for the hotel and she paid for my course. The problem is that I had no idea what to do. So I had this camera that my husband, a very old camera, 10-year-old camera that my husband had, and he gave it to me, but I didn't, I had no idea how to move and do and whatever. It was, 
I have to thank a lot the webs because they were, I was really by far the worst in the class because obviously I had no idea. And uh, they even so, they, they encouraged me. They were patients with my horrible, horrible pictures. And uh, they were very kind, extremely kind to me. So, and that, you know, makes such a difference in the beginning when you're very unsure because, first of all, I didn't love photography. I had no idea what I was getting into. I had no idea how to edit or pass, you know, to, they always, every day in the morning, they wanted you to bring a USB with your best picture. So my daughter had to do all that for me because obviously I didn't know how to move in the computer also. So it was, uh, it was a challenge, but it's a funny thing for you to just do one workshop and fall in love with something, which is really amazing. It talks, I think, a lot about my teachers <laughs> who were very good because that was such a surprise. Alex and Rebecca Webb, I mean, that's... That's usually uh, on people's, uh, you, you know, well, that, that's one of the things that I want to do is go on a, a, an Alex and Rebecca web I workshop. Didn't. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I had no idea what I was getting into. <laughs> she wanted to go to a class. It was my birthday. She said, OK, this is the only one I'm way of being together with my mother. So I do my class and she's together with me. You, you know, I'm looking at your website now and you have you know, a whole list of books and projects and, and, and awards as well. And, you know, the, these are things that, that people sometimes only dream of. Is there, is there any element of, uh, in your thoughts, maybe, oh, I wish I'd, I wish I'd been on that Alex and Rebecca Webb workshop 20 years ago or 30 yes. years ago, perhaps? Yes, 30, 40 years ago. Yes, I wish I had been. I mean, I will never know that if my mind was ready for it, because it has also, there is a component, I think, in photography of what you accumulated, what you saw that is registered there somewhere. And that helps you to take the picture because I know that I take some pictures and I say, yeah, this reminds me of this painter or this picture that I saw, you know, this exhibit, you know, there's a feeling of this or the other. Age aside, I wish, I wish more of us, um, you know, of any generation kind of thought that way as well and the pressures of social media, etc. And, and actually just, just doing what you enjoy and then... And exactly, then... and laughing and enjoying and, and taking in everything that surrounds you and being there in that moment and having fun. And I've been to workshops that I've seen younger people, you know, really cry, mm -hmm. anxious that they, the USB went wrong or yesterday, I don't know what, or I don't know what, how, you know, and it's that pressure is horrible. Talk me through the briefly the process of uh, picking up the camera at 60 and then having a book published not so many years later. How did that happen? Well, first of all, when I picked up after the workshop, I only used my camera when I went on trips, uh, holidays, because for at least three years, the camera was only for holidays. Mm -hmm. And then for some reason, it, I know what's the reason I think. I think I won an award by chance. So I said, oh, maybe I can really take it every day with me. <laughs> but fast forward a little bit and something very, very different, which is your latest book. I think it's very different anyway, in terms of the... Very different. Uh, very different. Yeah, the design, but also the, the photos inside. And I, I was just reading as, as we were, um, just before we, we, we kind of started the interview, the quote on the inside of the, uh, of the book itself. Uh, Clarice uh, Lispector quoted, it says, I do my best to write a report dry as extra dry champagne, but sometimes, forgive me, it gets wet. A dry thing is sterling silver, whereas gold is wet. Um, and that that kind of takes us straight into the, the book and this golden nature of it. And, the, you know, the colors, the tones, uh, the silhouettes, everything in this book is, uh, it, you know, it really is just it's golden. Um, so how did, where did this project start and how did, uh, how did you get along kind of getting these images? It started really with the, there was a, I don't know what's the game of, it was a soccer championship. I don't know if it was, which one it was, but, and it began with, I want to, to feel this atmosphere. What's because 
there was soccer on the TV the whole time because Brazil was, uh, you know, it, I don't know, it's the um, World Cup. I think it was the World Cup. Mm -hmm. And people were crazy only talking about, but I wanted to feel it not in the bars and people drinking or people... I wanted to feel it, what happened with the people when they, and everyone was playing soccer. In the, they always do play anyway, but they went crazy. And then it began to dawn on me also that it was a wonderful way of revisiting my childhood because that's where all my childhood was spent. It was the program was going to the beach every weekend and my parents and the, my my friends and everything. And for you to look at the beach that is completely different nowadays. And this is uh, Ipanema in Rio. Ipanema. Yeah, I began to photograph in Urca, it, which was a, it's a much more family-oriented beach, and much safer beach. So I began there because I was scared. And then I said, okay, now let's try Ipanema. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And then I went and uh, because it's a tougher beach, it's a more, you know, yep. they, they steal your stuff. And I had my camera stolen and things like that. The book itself, the, uh, how, how do you curate a book like this? Do you, do you, do you actually do the editing? Are you selecting oh, the images? No. Oh, no, no, no. I select the images first. Mm -hmm. I do an A list and a B list. But then I go to my editor and, uh, and also Alex Webb and Rebecca, both of them help me. And uh, first I ask them their opinion as art. So mm -hmm. they help me art-wise, what they think they believe of these pictures are the best. Yeah. And, uh, and when it comes to the editing and the processing of the images, are, are you doing that or does the editor do that or? No, no, no. Now I can do it. <laughs> now, now it's easy. Yeah. Now it's fine. I mean, now it's okay. Yeah. So it's an exper more experimental, more crazy book. <laughs> <laughs> but let's see. Uh, I'm lucky to do something new. And uh, I, I wouldn't be able to be, you know, that, that finished, I need to go forward. And then after that when I want to do something else also. So I, I always want to explore. Some will be more successful than others, but I think it's, uh, it's the only way I can be enthusiastic is if I have new projects and new ways of looking at things. Yeah, well, I think it's a great, you know, it's great that you're you're forward thinking like that. And I mean, just looking at your website, you've you've got plenty of, you already seem to have plenty of material. I I love the the titling of some of your series as well, Symphony of Lines. That's just beautiful. Just Thank the name you. of it is beautiful, and the pictures, of course, are beautiful as well. Yeah, I just um, went to Alaska, and there's one. It's so funny. It's Alaskan patterns, and I I looked at you know it was beautiful to go to Alaska, and then I said. I have no way to compete with these amazing, you know, National Geographic pictures. Mm -hmm. So I said, no, I'm going to do something completely different. So it's Alaskan patterns. Of, it's very abstract, like modern paintings. Yeah. So it's completely different. You know, I said, no, but I, because, you know, the nature is so amazing, but I don't have the camera for that. And I'm not a nature photographer. So I, I have to get what I can yeah. With my possibilities, that's the only thing I can do. I mean, that's it. And that's great that that's in your mindset, isn't it? Because that, that's a little bit um, regarding what we spoke about earlier, about this idea of not, not worrying, really. You know, some... No, you'll get something out of it. You yeah. just need, need just to have some peace to look around, get out of your, your daily life and be able... Like, it's a kind of meditation. You just go from your busy life and, okay, cut everything out and concentrate on what you sing and have fun and then something comes out i think for me it does so every day every day of my life that i go out shooting i come back with so many the problem is i in one hour i come back with a thousand pictures and my problem is the editing because yeah. i sleep too late at night because i always see very much. And it, that's, that means that I'm very enthusiastic. So it's very good. I think it, uh, thank God. Thank God. 
Yeah. Well, the enthusiasm comes through uh, not only in the pictures, but just listening to you speaking about your work because it's it's a wonderful story and and it's uh, you, you know it's it. it uh, I'm I'm reticent to say you know you you came to photography late in life because that's very subjective. The, you know, late in life can can mean anything, um, but just the fact that you you know in eight short years you've uh, you found something that you you love doing. I love yeah. I love and no, what I think is amazing. What is my question is that I don't know the answer to. Is uh, I found photography completely by mistake. I never wanted to do photo. I never thought of photographers. I never, obviously I was, I saw a lot of arts, okay? Because I lived in Europe. So I went to a lot of museums. I was exposed to a lot of art. But how many things could we do, all of us, and be good at mm. that we will never find out? Yeah. Because my, my, the lesson I have is that why, why photo? I mean, it's, it was such a strange thing. I mean, would I be good at some, you know, whatever, or you or anyone, or mm -hmm. so many other potentials that maybe we have that we will not know until, yeah. you know, we are gone. Absolutely. Well, it, it's a, you know, it's a lesson in uh, not perseverance, but just trying something, you know, and, and mistakes or not mistakes, but the, you know, the coming to things exactly. later on, choosing not to do them, you know, young, that's not, not an issue. It's the fact that actually, you know, anybody can do anything really if they try and they, and ultimately if they enjoy it. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. That's the, the word for it. Enjoy it. Have fun. And don't be scared of experimenting, I think, and, and getting it wrong. It's part of growing. It, you have to get it wrong. <laughs> it's not, yeah. you know, and that's it. And you'll get it better tomorrow after tomorrow. And it's the only bad thing about being older that I find, all the others are positive. The only bad one is that I have to do a, a math that younger people don't need to do. I have to do the math. How long do I have available for me? So I, I, that's why I hurry so much. That's why I'm doing the third book. And after that, I want to do fourth book because I know that there isn't so much left on the other side. So that's the only one that I found that is the negative. Well, but maybe because it's negative, it pushes me to do more. <laughs> and we look forward to, to seeing more and hearing more. Sandra Catania Adorno sharing a story with Kev of doing what you love because you never quite know where it may lead wherever you are whatever your age and however you believe your skill to be initially being there in the moment and of course um, a wonderful story picking up a camera at age 60 and becoming a, a published photographer just just a handful of years later Sandra's enthusiasm shining through as Kev rightly said and of course we'll link to Sandra's work and the book on the show notes page today at fujicast.co.uk um, a fitting inspirational chat for the 200th show. We have plans coming up for something to celebrate in early 2022. But in the meantime, thank you for your messages through mail and Facebook. And thank you, too, to our friends at Fuji Love, sharing the love in this podcast space. Hey, Neil and Kev, we here at Fuji Love want to congratulate you on 200 amazing episodes. Now, with episode 200 being your explicit show, I wanted to borrow Neil's censorship soundboard for this very special message. Let me just uh, power this thing on. Alrighty. We here at Fujilove want to say what a job you've done for the entire Fujifilm community. Neil, you've done a job. And Kev, you've done the job. I'm sure Fujifilm is proud of the work. On behalf of everyone here at Fuji Love, this is wishing you 200 more. Wait, my name was censored? Wait, that, that can't be right. No, no, not, 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 none of this should have been censored. I didn't swear. Oh, God, this is bullshit. Oh, that goes through. Happy 200, guys. And of course, and of course so far, we've behaved ourselves. Uh, thank you, Mark, and thank you to the, uh, the team also at Fuji Love. Right, let's get back to your questions. Kev, it's your turn. You you go first. 
Okay, so uh, Keith Martin very uh, asks a very apposite uh, question. Mm. He says, "Hello, hello, chaps. Y- you're surprised I said apposite." Aren't no, you? no, I, well, I was going to say that's a, a me word usually. I know. Oh, well, that's where I got it from. Oh, uh, <laughs> I don't want. I don't know what it means, but you say it a lot, so I thought it can't be that bad. It's a flavour of ice cream, Kev. It Ap- must- <laughs> apposite, apposite, and rum. Love it. It must, must be on the BBC alone list. <laughs> I think it must be. Yeah, we did used to have a, a list of words you can't say. Oh, I bet you did. Yeah. yeah. Although uh, these days I hear um, uh, now Sam doesn't like the B word. What uh, BBC? <laughs> no, she does. She doesn't. Okay, I'll say it. She doesn't like the word bloody. She thinks it's it's base and it's worse than some of the other words. Uh, but I hear it being said by James O'Brien, my favourite talk show uh, presenter on LBC all the time and he's a very well spoken very articulate chap so what's in a word but it was definitely on the bbc band list i'm not surprised yeah. yes um right this is from keith martin then he says hello chaps uh been listening for quite a long time and feel i have gotten to know you both via the podcast ah. but never heard the story about how it all began so for this anniversary edition <laughs> can you share the story ta well myself and kev met across a dance floor um muddy faces yeah muddy faces yeah you're not looking very well processed today kev yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i've got my x trans one face on today <laughs> that's it <laughs> uh i don't know well how did we have the because we have many ideas usually i'm a, I, a kev i know you just you just humor me now because i say kev i've got a great idea we're going to do a commercial business blah 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 and you say that's a really great idea and i know you know that i'll forget within 24 hours oh uh, no no I, I never say i think things are good ideas if i don't think they're good ideas if i think they're not good ideas i just don't reply all right well i've had plenty I, of those i, I always well. reply and then yes the thing is it's always for us it's always because yeah. we're busy and then it's like yeah we'll do it in the winter we'll do it in the winter mm. and then and then and then, then we never know. do i mean well, well the latest yeah. idea was was um having uh, well, you can tell us actually. You can give us some feedback on this. Our audio book of how to be a wedding photographer, mm. which I thought was a really good idea. Yeah, which we'll still do, hopefully, yeah. when the time's right. When 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 the uh, uh, when we get a bit more time, well, yeah. which is certainly not this month. Well, it's not this month. It's probably not next month, but it could be the month after. Could, oh, I got really busy November actually, but oh, yeah. uh, October's quieter for me. Oh, uh, well, quite. I've got four weddings. What are you in doing October, in November but, then? But, how comes you're so busy? I got five weddings in November. Good heavens! I think, or is that December? Oh, anyway, uh, I can't even remember. But anyway, we will do it. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I don't. Um, I mean, the idea of it. I'm. We've sort of the Chinese whispered our way through this uh, uh, to an extent now that we've forgotten what the real story was. I sense probably a pub conversation, wasn't it? Or an Indi- over an Indian meal, probably at some point. I, I think it all started with. You started to uh, move your studio around a little bit and start putting in, you know, the, uh, yeah, the microphones and everything. Yeah. And, and and really, you needed or wanted, you know, something to to use it with, use it on. Yeah, I mean, I can't just um, do voiceovers. I do do voiceovers, but I wanted yeah. to do something more creative than just being given a thirty second script. Yeah. So so yeah, we had we had plenty of chats about it, and uh, we decided to do it. And I remember the very first one. I did feel a little bit like it was you asking me questions an interview um, an interview almost yeah and but the, which was entirely my my fault and then we we kind of uh yeah, well, we, well, i've grown into it i think a little bit yeah, yeah. i mean yeah. your radio thing has helped you as well but you are i think it's been identified but there's one particular mentor of mine jb you know who you are um who has always suggested that it does feel more like i'm the facilitator and you're the expert and <laughs> for very good reason you are the expert. I mean, I think it's funny when sometimes you turn it around and you say, and you read a technical question out and you say, right, over to you then. Because <laughs> you know damn well I won't know the answer. Um, <laughs> now we're all wondering who JB is. I know. You, that was very secretive. <laughs> I know, I like that. Do you like that? Yeah. James Bond. So, yeah, and, and that's true. I think you are, you, you, I mean, generally I do interview you. If it were the Morecambe and Wise show, you're definitely the Morecambe, but a cleverer. Um, I know Morecambe was not not clever. What I mean is, you're you're the Morecambe, uh, <laughs> the star, the the one you know, the one that people tune in for, and um, I make it I happen. No, you got all that wrong. Anyway, I'm back wise. To the original. I'm, I'm wise. To- Eric, yeah. it was Eric Morecambe and Ernie Wise. Ernie Wise, not Eric Wise. Ernie Wise. But that's generally, I mean, in format terms, Kev, that is what happens. It's kind of if it were a tennis match, I'm serving you 
a really nice opportunity to pop one across court. That's my job. All right, McEnroe, let's get back to the script. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we are. We are. We're talking about the history of the show. So that's how it started. I think it did start as an interview show with the Mullins. Oh, and it's it did, become yeah. a softer interview show. But it's always remained an interview show. Because generally you answer the you answer the well. Let's talk about the the, Helin, uh, the Helsinki Helinski the Helsinki bus thing just a moment ago. I thought right, how can we? Um, I'm always thinking how can I get Kev to reveal? Well, not in a literal sense, clearly, because that would frighten the kids to death. <laughs> Nobody wants to see his, do they? But uh, um, am, yeah, I, am uh, I embarrassing maybe. you? I don't know. No, not really. Um, yeah, maybe it is. I, I have different kind of thought processes about it, but um, I, you know, I, somebody somebody was asking me one of the wedding guests on the weekend. Yeah, was saying, yeah. they listen to the podcast. Oh, right. Um, you know, and he was saying that it was. Uh, I was saying to him actually, w- what I always try and make it, what I was trying to describe it as, is a bit of photography, a light entertainment photography podcast. Yes. Yeah. That's what I try. You know, it's not all boring and, and you know, kind of just tech and talk and, no, and all no. that kind of stuff. You know, we, we try and keep it a bit lighthearted. Yeah, and <laughs> gen- gen- generally it is. I Sometimes think. I, I think maybe even some people might laugh at one bit, you know, <laughs> maybe one bit a show. That's, you know, it's like when you do a wedding, you've got one, one portfolio shot. picture out oh, of it. You well, think, oh, that was good. That like was that. It. It's a bit worrying if wedding guests are now listening to it. We really are going to have to be careful with what we say. Uh, yeah, well, although this wedding guest was a wedding photographer, so ah, yeah, uh, yeah okay. it's kind of fair enough. Well, but anyway, sense. yes, I think um, yeah, I think it all kind of started there, and uh, you know, we knew, or you knew, you knew all about the audio stuff and podcasting, and how mm. how big and popular it was was then, and, and was going to become and growing. Yeah, and yeah, I was reading some. Well, you probably know the, the the stats more than me. Not not kind of listener stats, but only something like 0.2 percent of podcasts have our kind of listenership in terms of numbers and and longevity so yeah i think we've done reasonably well well to get to 200 as we've always said um or we've talked about before the the general uh, thing is if you get past seven episodes you you can consider yourself a podcaster but then you have to expand after that and it's the consistency is a hard thing with podcasting and that's where most podcasts fall down they do it they go gung-ho at it and then they think oh blimey i can't do this I've had that to that extent. I've I've had that sort of problem with Photography Daily in that I started out thinking, right, five days a week, here we go, bang, could we possibly do seven? Yes, let's do an extra one. But it, and the reality is if you want to do quality, once a week, good show, and occasionally with an extra, bang, that's what that's all you need. You should do you should do it live, like my radio show. It, oh, there's no choice. No way. <laughs> It's, no. it's live <laughs> and it's rubbish. <laughs> no, it's not rubbish, Kev. No, it's not always rubbish, but the music's good anyway. I don't know how you do a, a live podcast. It's not a bit... It's um, Because unlike... Um, we don't have the mechanism to do that. You could do it as a live YouTube thing or a Facebook thing. Of course you could. But as a podcast itself, it doesn't have the same the same mechanics behind it. Yeah, you'd have to stream it, wouldn't you? Something like Mixcloud allows you to do live podcasting. But yes, getting it onto people's phones, they'd have to have the Mixcloud app and all that kind of stuff. Maybe we should do a Christmas live, Kev. I wonder, I wonder, I'm sure I just read something about Spotify doing, allowing people to do live podcasts. Oh yeah, no, that could be, yeah. Worth of research. Yeah. Um, on that point, by the way, I, we haven't mentioned it, so people may have seen it. That at the bottom of the show notes each week, we are putting um, Neil's latest Photography Daily th- stream. Yeah. So once you've listened to this, and only after you've listened to this, you can click his little button, <laughs> right. listen to his his show, yeah. and then after that, my radio show is at the bottom, I know. far bottom of the page. And you can listen to that as well yeah. if you want. So yeah, uh, e- extra mullins. Um, okay, Robin Chun. I care. Oh, this is just hi, Kevin. So this one really is over to you. Here we go. McEnroe serving this one up. Just pop it cross court. Um, like many of us, I have many images on my hard drive and backed up in the cloud. But what to do with them? Of course, there's a simple choice of printing them out as either framed artwork, a book or my idea of holding an exhibition. The venue would not be a problem for me. It's relatively easy to hire the equipment necessary like stands and so on. So my question is how to format it, so to speak. How many images do you exhibit? Should you organise into themes, genres or projects? Uh, and what would your thoughts be on how to promote such an event? Well, there's quite a few questions in there. So should we, uh, should we take one at a time? How, so let's go for how many images, first of all, which is a bit of a how long is a piece of string question. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, that depends a lot on 
you know the size of the venue all that kind of stuff i quite like uh, exhibitions where it's very very simple uh you know even to the point where it might just be one or two images per wall uh you know it depends on the size of the walls obviously mm. but yeah something very very simple very straightforward you can move across very easily um i don't particularly enjoy exhibitions where you have to look up and down and there's low ones and high ones and all that mm. kind of stuff mm. um a bit like the the photo books that i like really make it as simple as possible yeah. but yeah numbers that's that's very arbitrary compared you know depending on on where and when and all that kind of stuff um but yeah i mean the the, the key thing is just make sure it's your best stuff don't don't put anything in that you think is okay uh, this is okay i'm gonna fill a gap by putting this one in if you don't think it's you know 100 percent nailed on then don't nail it on do you do you remember the um the home exhibition mm -hmm. i thought that was really well done although it was uh, a lot of it did conform to what you're talking about you know images very obviously in front of you move left to right there were some sets in there weren't there um, yeah. where you literally were within a home or the front room of mm -hmm. a home. And I thought that was quite well done. Not too clever for itself. You could mm -hmm. understand it. You could read it. And that, I think that's what you mean, isn't it, that you, you're able to read the exhibition as you look at it. Yeah, make sure it's, it's you know, thematic as well. Make sure mm. it, it kind of, you know, it's it's not really going to be particularly great if it's just like, you know, Robin's best pictures and they're totally yeah. random, you know, nature, architecture, street, okay. you know, whatever. Make sure it's uh, thematic. Well, you've kind of answered that. Should it, should you organise it into themes? So your answer is yes on that one. I think so. And I would imagine genres and projects pretty much come into that as well. Mm -hmm. and, and I suppose the way you exhibit, he was talking about uh, he has the equipment necessary, but there's so many interesting ways that you can – you can exhibit. I remember, uh, where was it? A uh, Jersey. It was Jersey. In Jersey, they have these um, these uh, caves. Sort of, I think they date back to World War Two, where the army, the military, and the the medical um, facilities were sort of sunk back into caves. I'm sure, that was Jersey. And they they got some of these rooms, and they'd they'd. In, es in essence, got two pieces of, um, uh, of see-through plastic, uh, acetate or whatever, and they'd sandwiched the pictures between the acetate and hung it from fishing wire, is what it looked like, fishing wire, from the ceiling. And you, you walked through the exhibition. It wasn't on the wall. It was you walked around it and through the exhibition, almost yeah, like you're nice. snaking your way through, which I thought was a really cool idea. And I would have thought relatively inexpensive. Yeah, that's quite a nice idea, definitely, especially if it fits the environment. You know, if you're in, in, in an environment that, that that lends itself to, then absolutely. It was yeah. cavernous space. It felt. Make felt sure the lighting is right, though. That's the key thing. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Make sure you've got your spotlights uh, in the ceiling or wherever they're laid out. And, you know, they are they are illuminating correctly the images. So, you know, you don't want if you if you've got a, a moody black and white image that's meant to represent, you know, mood and darkness and everything. Uh, you, you don't want a bright light glaring on that. Um, and, and likewise, if you've got glass on the front. I mean, this is all what the exhibition space would be doing. Uh, you know, you don't want to have reflections and things. Non-reflective so. glass is an absolute essential, isn't it? Otherwise, you're yeah. in trouble. Right. Thank you, Robin, for that. Right. Book of the week, then. Yes. So, uh, Bertine van Manen, uh, the book is archive mm. and uh you can get this from the photo bookstore.co.uk you can get it from macbooks.co.uk also who are the publishers it is listed on amazon but it's not available there so um it's around about 50 pounds you can get signed editions as well it's uh currently it's a new release two, uh, 2021 right. first edition and it's wonderful it's like this uh, well i'll read the blurb right so um uh, in fact, first of all, I'll read the, the, the little quote from The Independent. So using a simple snapshot camera, Van Manen portrays the wild calm of the landscape and brutal intimacy of the lives and deaths of its dwellers. Uh, since 1970s, Dutch photographer uh, Bertin Van Manen has created an intimate and poignant photographs of commonplace scenes produced during extended trips to Europe, America, China, and the former Soviet Union. Mm. Van Manen has established herself as a unique voice in documentary photography, her visual language imbued with the empathy and respect for the everyday lives of her subjects. This book presents an extensive overview of Van Manen's work alongside diary entries and previously unpublished selections from her archive. The book has been edited and designed by renowned Dutch designer Hans Griemann, to offer a unique insight and overview of Van Manen's history, establishing this publication as the ultimate reference work on her. 
Um, and it is wonderful. And the first thing that you notice about this book is is the design. Actually, funny enough, um, you know, it's got this lovely it's like a negative. Uh, uh, yeah, well, the front cover, yes, but it's got a lovely fly sheet. It's kind of fly sheet. You can pull the book out, and the fly sheet is about four oh. times the size of the book. Um, and yes, it's it's one of the it's it's got diary entries. The first page, for example, you open it up, and you know it's got sketches on it. It's got handwritten notes on it. Um, it's beautiful little black and white pictures of kids playing in the garden, yeah. and it's a vertical book mostly. And luckily, as as far as I can tell, <laughs> scanning through it, not going across. No, so the horizontal images, you basically have to turn the book around to look at them, which is ace. I'm happy with that, uh, rather than spreading it across the spine. Yeah. Um, there are a couple like that, but, but by and large, they're not. Um, and yeah, it's just just this wonderful, again, it's one of those books where if you, you know, you pick it up, if you, if you, if you were a non-photographer and this was on somebody's uh, uh, coffee table and you picked it up and you opened it up, you'd think, oh, that's a, what's that? It's a picture of a, a pen and it's a little bit out of focus. Um, and because a lot of this stuff is is taken on uh, instant cameras, a lot of it's taken, you know, many years ago. And there's there's a there's a beauty in the um, I think in the vulnerability of the pictures. I have to say. And as we move kind of through the book, you'll you'll delve into images that are very much snapshots, but but make the grade, and then a far more um, kind of uh, artistic studies i suppose i love absolutely love the black and white pictures on the tubes buses and stuff like that and uh, I, I think probably in the soviet union looking at the, the way people are dressed um i mean wonderful it's just nostalgia and it's in its incredible element there's a couple of self-portraits as well so it's not um i would say it's probably kind of 50 percent black and white 50 percent color there's uh you know, there's there's images from people's living rooms, it, cluttered living rooms in the middle of what we used to call uh, nightmare hour. You know, when it's, it's the hour the kids need to go to bed and everything, and <laughs> nightmare hour just going wrong. <laughs> um, you know, you've got kids, you've got a little girl here with you know with a bum showing as she's trying to somebody's trying to put her uh, dressing gown on. You've got yeah. another kid on the floor who's just crying. You've got kids with. Uh, kids everywhere you've got yes, dad that sounds like there. nightmare hour yeah, yeah. Does, <laughs> dad's sitting there kind of just thinking oh my god i didn't sign up for this um <laughs> and, and and you know and then there's also these really beautiful portraits uh i'm looking at one now on page 179 of a family just by their car you know and this this would have been probably maybe early 80s late 70s you know and the old man looks like super proud he's got these uh, these kids and he's got this car and uh you know he's he, the the area he's living in it looks pretty run down and everything so he's just proud of the fact that he's he's got this yeah. and it's it's just this there's no particular story to the images as such uh, some of them are in sequence um but it, it is another one of those ones where you can just literally flick through it you know i'm looking there's there's one and this is a split spread um page two, uh, 203 and uh, this is Appalachian Mountains. So we're in America now, and uh, they're in America, aren't they? Appalachian Mountains. Yeah, they're they're sort of um, northeast, aren't they? I think. Yeah, um, and this is a great picture uh, of this uh, this kind of a block of uh, apartments, if you like. And you've got this uh, this guy and this woman. He's swinging the woman around. Uh, they're playing, you know, they're like just in the middle of this green field. You've got this entire family watching on, laughing, hundreds of kids. And then right in the front of the frame, you've got this little girl who's jumped up into the in into the photographer's face. So you've got this like big face sticking into the frame, um, <laughs> which is wonderful. And you really you can you can see when the uh, the images are taken with the uh, the kind of point and shoot instant cameras, and yeah. when they're taken with more um, kind of grown up cameras, let's say. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it really is wonderful. At the back, there's a, a detailed kind of index of each of the frames and what they're from, what they represent. Um, and, you know, the, the notes, the, the handwritten notes inside, you know, you've got diary entries. It, it's just a really, really, really beautiful book. Um, really is beautiful. It's a softback book. Um, so it's, uh, you know, you need to probably take a little bit of care of it because I think it's one of those ones that you will you want to kind of keep for a long time. I think it's one that's going to have quite a bit of value given time. Um, yeah, late 70s, early 80s, Netherlands. I've been talking a lot about um, using um, your camera. On, we, well, we've been talking a lot about it on PD, about using your camera as a sketchbook. And um, Bertian has done exactly that, hasn't she, really? I mean, some of the, there's one I'm looking at here, which in essence just looks like a load of papers 
strewn across a desk in front of a library. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of that. But there's a lot of proper character um, studies as well. Page mm. 106, 1975 Budapest, there's this, uh, it, 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 it's essentially a man in a bar, a cafe, but, you know, he's having a beer. Yeah. And and it, there's two frames in this, uh, this sequence. And he's... Uh, you've also got another character in this frame who's to the left, but he's the he's the front layer, the main the main protagonist, if you like, is is at the back, and he's looking at this bottle of beer yeah. uh, with his hands in his pocket, as if to say, "Should I, should I, <laughs> should I or not?" Uh, and you know, we don't know. Maybe he's got a drink problem. Maybe you know, maybe he's got a troubled life. Maybe maybe that's just a total misrepresentation of of what's going on in the scene. And then the second frame is. It, Pretty much exactly the same, but he's just turned very slightly, and so this this like lovely light falls on his face, yeah. and you know he still he still hasn't touched the beer. It's exactly the same. Um, interestingly, there's an empty glass next to it. There's there's his glass which is full, and then there's another empty glass. That's your maybe glass. He's waiting. Maybe he's waiting for somebody. <laughs> My glass. <there. laughs> maybe he's waiting for somebody. You know, it's just yeah. you, you look at this, and and so 1975. This guy is probably in his. Then he's probably. Uh, late 60s maybe right. you know so he's or you know all intents and purposes probably no longer around and mm. you just wonder what happened did the person he was waiting for turn up did he go on to become you know a, a famous <laughs> insurance seller whatever but oh your you know, brain your just, mind works i don't know i go everywhere no, well, no i can't I, I think the wrong things first and so i then pacify <laughs> it with both getting you know, as bland as possible she's um, she's a traveler i mean Oh yeah, Sofia, Absolutely. Amsterdam, Toulouse, Belgrade, Rome, Barcelona, Budapest. I mean, there's just some of the places within one book. Yeah, the ones in Harlem are really nice as well. You yeah, know, and because I bet. of course, when you think about Harlem in the seventies, you know, it was the down the downbeat area, wasn't it, of, yeah. uh, of New York State, New York, New York City kind of area. Mm. You really get that idea. You know, we're in a in a kitchen here. Um, with a mother who's who's cooking and a little girl who looks like she's just jumped out of the bath. She's got a towelling robe on, wet hair, um, and and they're both looking. The, the lady is trying to smile a little bit, but obviously is clearly busy. She's got stacked frying pans, um, you know, because she's she hasn't got a big hob. Uh, in the background is is you know all these kind of raw materials pinned to the wall, and you know there's there's um, uh, wet, you know, the walls are wet from damp and everything, and it's it's just a real kind of insight into yeah. into this stuff. Do you know uh, much about Bertie? Um, because uh, I'm assuming these were, it's an archive, so these these are pictures taken across a career. But many of her other books are, are, are very similar in terms of the, the the style and the way that she photographs. And I'm thinking, where, where can I get a photographic job like this? This sounds a dream. Yeah, absolutely. I mean. <sighs> I'm looking at, I'm just looking at her Wikipedia entry now. So she was born in 1942. So she's still, you know, she's yeah. still very much a, a working photographer. Well, still exhibitions um, going on, actually, with her name. Yeah, actually, yeah. So. She, uh, in fact, the first exhibition was at the Photographer's Gallery in London. <gasps> right. Uh, just off Oxford Street. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that she's probably, you know, one of these, these kind of wandering documentary photographers. Yeah. She probably does make, the, you know, I don't know enough about her. She probably does make, uh, good money from the books, but I also suspect she's a uh, commissioned photojournalist for news agencies and yeah. various things like that, magazines, you know, kind of editorial stuff. Uh, but yeah, wonderful. Really she was wonderful. inspired by Robert Frank's book, The Americans. Or- yeah, that that uh, that makes sense. It does doesn't it? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I love the self portrait on the front as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, just kind of again, not you know it. it like if you were making a portrait of somebody, especially if you're making a portrait of yourself, yeah. um, like the angle of this is not the the angle you would choose. Uh, you know, there's a bright light above the head and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, one sleeve up, one sleeve down. But that's what I love about it. It's, yeah. it's just this organic photography. Um, and we don't see enough of that. You know, we, we really don't see enough of that anymore. This this world of, you know, perfection and everything. Um, and, and it goes back to what we were talking about a little bit earlier, doesn't it? About yeah. this, you know, when we're talking about Louis Galvan and stuff. And, and you know, it's it's not about it's not about being able to click the button. It's not about being able to, you know, to, you know, stop worrying about noise and grain and all that kind of stuff. Look at this stuff and then think, yeah, actually, I'm opening my eyes now. Well, the pictures aren't made any more interesting because they're technically perfect. You're looking at a diary of somebody's and a journey of somebody's life here, aren't you? Many of them aren't technically no, perfect. No, I mean, no. they're far more perfect than I could ever make them. But uh, you know, then they're, they're not. That, that's the whole point. You know, yeah. you're 
you know, and 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 you you know, we 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 get this quite often on the on the Facebook group about uh, you know, I'm, I'm moving to Sony because I don't feel like Fuji cameras mm. are a, a greater six thousand four hundred ISO. I'm like, well. You, you do whatever you want, but have a look at this stuff and, uh, you know, look at the grain in that and look at the love and look at the emotion. and look. At yeah, well, I'm not necessarily talking I about about that. I'm talking about composition. I'm talking about making a picture of something that you think, well, that's not much. Of, well, I'm going to I'm going to make a picture anyway. Not necessarily to do with whether it's good at 6.4 or whatever, but but more about just daring to lift the camera and say, I want to make a picture. And you yeah, do. And it's not it's not always about people. You know, we, again, we've we've talked about it so many times this idea the idea of nostalgia and yeah. you know just taking pictures of your own front doors and things like that and yes there's plenty of pictures yes. here yeah. there's a picture here of the telephone yeah. uh, on the bedside table with a box of cigarettes a bottle of bacardi a bottle of gin three boxes of cigarettes <laughs> telephone um are we back a, on the Gemma? a tub of something <laughs> and one of the old walkmans you know with the tape oh, in it god Another, yes the walkmans uh, uh, well, you know, funnily enough, I mean, we'll talk about this next week because we've run right out of time now. But, but um, I'm this weekend. Um, I don't have a wedding on the Saturday. Although, if you're listening to this next week, and I am covering your wedding on a Saturday, that'll be very confusing. But look, from the time it's being recorded, and I'm I'm going up to see. Um, I'm going up to do a little bit of train spotting with my youngest because you know he loves the trains. And we're going back to my original town. And I said, you know what? I'm 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 purposefully going to use you, Sonny, because you look uh, you know still young and cute enough that I can knock on a door, and, and of my my first first house and say, is there any chance I could take some pictures of the garden? And that yeah. plays exactly into what you're talking about, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Have a wander round. I'm sure they'll yeah. let you wander around. Go and see your old bedroom. Well, that's what I want to do. But the, f- the first time I wrote to uh, the the, um, the woman that owns the house now, she said, yeah, I remember your mum and dad. She's had it for years. Um, now, that was uh, quite a while ago, so she may not be around now. But, but she said, oh, I don't think it's a wise idea that you come back here should never open things that you've seen from you. She might as well have just said, no, I don't fancy you walking around the house and being yeah. a bit more honest about it. So I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that she's still alive, obviously, yes, but she's she's mellowed and changed her, her ways. And the presentation of a small, cute child holding a cube of pictures from that house to, uh, to, to so I don't just look like some nut job um, sort of knocking on a door. Sorry, I hate that expression. I do apologise. But um, that, that she's going to let me in. That's what I'm hoping, Kev. Take a bunch of flowers, everything wins. That's a good idea, that's what I'm going to do. Of course, if I can get there, and I don't have to travel on an M25 where protesters have stopped me getting there in the first place. <laughs> yeah. Moving on. That's it, Kev, 200. 200 done. Hooray! What's the, next, what's the next big one? Um, 201. <laughs> one show at a time, Kev. <laughs> See you back here for that, then. <laughs> All right, well, we will do something special for the 200th it's just sort of postponed until the new year at some stage isn't it yeah. but thank you um, we will see you next week on the show don't forget to get your uh, your emails in to click at fujicast.co.uk how do they get the Facebook ones in Kev uh, go to the Facebook group Fujicast uh, there's a thread pinned to the top and also don't forget you can uh, give a friend on Patreon and uh, ah, yeah. uh, you can get them to the front Bump to the front well, there we go. Raise a glass, Kev. One for you there. There we go. And um, oh, thanks very much for your one on the way back. <laughs> Sorry. I, normally you tell me to be quiet at this point. No, so I'm... no. <laughs> no. No, well, since we've sorted out the electronics and how it works on this this line here, it seems to work. Anyway, we'll see you next week, Kev. Bye. The Fujicast is an independent Loading Zone production. Email the show with your questions and words of wisdom to click at fujicast.co.uk. Email any complaints and political nonsense to our wives who will deal with your comments in their own good time and in their own good way.